Okay, so we've talked about double integrals. Now we're going to get into some triple integrals. From a computational standpoint, this is not hard to do. If you already understand how we do double integrals, jump into triple integrals is no big deal. Um, from a conceptual standpoint, we need to get into that a little bit more. So let's start with that. So when we look at uh, triple integrals, uh, we're jumping our variables up. Uh, we're going to consider a function, say, w of f, x, y, z, that's continuous on a rectangular box. Now, this is the idea of triple integrals largely, is that this box, and this box is going to eventually have a fairly loose interpretation of a box. But for right now, this box is in terms of x, y, and z. It's an interval on the x, an interval on the y, and an interval on the z. So if I work with an interval on the x, an interval on the y, and an interval on the z, and I put that together, that gives me this box that we're going to talk about here. So we're integrating a function over this box. And if you look at this, this really gets to the kind of basic idea of what triple integrals are, is you're integrating a function over a volume. So remember, we have sort of this idea of single integrals uh, and double integrals so far. In single integrals, we integrate a function over an interval. Double integrals, we integrate a function over an area. And now triple integrals, we're going to integrate a function over some volume. And this volume is this box we're talking about. And again, eventually, that box is going to be loosely defined as your traditional box. All right. So... What we're going to do is we're going to encompass B with a network of boxes, okay? So we're basically going to grid it off, sort of similar to what we do with the intervals and the areas uh, in single and double integrals. So we grid it off, and it essentially creates all these mini boxes inside of this box, each one of them having their own volume, okay? Uh, we're going to say this is an inner partition consisting of all the boxes lying entirely within B, uh, if we were to find the volume of each one of these little sub-boxes, it would be delta x, delta y, delta z. So if you kind of think about this, if you partition the x-axis here up, the width there, each one of those widths that we divvy that up in is delta x. If we do the same thing on the y-axis here and we divvy this up, each one of those little partitions is delta y. And then the same thing happens on the z-axis, and each one of those is delta z. So if you pull one of these boxes out and you look at it, each side length is uh, delta y, delta x, delta z. So then the volume of one of those boxes would be delta x, delta y, and delta z. Okay, so it's the volume of one of those little mini elements here. And then what I want to do is I want to find the volume of the whole box here, this whole big box. What I have to do is I have to add all those little volumes up. Okay. But that's not really what we're going to do. Because what we're doing is we're going to integrate this function over the box. So I don't want to know what the volume of the box is. I want to know what the volume of the function over that box is going to be. So what we do is we stack these little mini boxes up to the function, and we add up all those. So, so if I place this function through this box, and I only count the little sub-boxes that are sitting underneath this function here, okay, you get a picture that looks similar to this. And so rather than find the volume of all the boxes in here to make up this big box. I'm only looking at all these little sub-boxes that sit underneath this function. And I'm going to add all these little guys up. And so the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to add it by adding up stacks of boxes. Okay. So if I find the volume of one of these, then I want to find the volume of a stack of boxes. What I have to do is figure out, well, how high is that stack going to go? Well, the stack is going to go up to when I hit the function. So if I take the volume of one box, 
which is here, this delta V, and I multiply it by the height that I need to go up to, so the height of the stack, which will tell me how many boxes I need to use for that particular stack, or this stack, or this stack, or this stack. If I take the volume of one box and I multiply it by the function, okay, that'll give me the volume of a stack of boxes. And then I'm going to add up all my stacks. Okay, if I add up this stack and this stack and this stack and this stack, what I'm going to get is an idea of what the volume of all these boxes in here added up will equal. And that should give me an estimate of the volume that I'm calculating here. And the question always comes up, well, isn't this the thing, same thing as those rectangular prisms we were adding up in double integrals? Well, yes, it is, okay, in this particular picture. But the reason why we might want to do it this way instead of using those rectangular prisms is not every volume necessarily is this simple in that it's calculated off of an area in the xy plane. This picture is, but not every single one is. Let's say my volume was a little bit more complicated. Let's say the volume kind of came out and had maybe like an arm and an arm off of here. And I wanted to find the volume of all this space. Well, I could start stacking my boxes next to each other outward this way and start filling in this space with these boxes. Okay, these are great boxes I'm drawing but I could start stacking them up here. And they're not coming off of the XY plane, right? All this space in here is hollow, right? There's no, no volume in there that I'm calculating. So the reason why we would want to do this is because our volume isn't necessarily always going to be built off the XY plane upward, okay? When it's built off the XY plane upward, then you could just use rectangular prisms to find the volume. But if you have a little bit more of a complex volume, that say isn't done that way or um, you know is between two surfaces themselves so let's say you have you know a surface up here and a surface down here and you want to find the volume in between it's not built off the xy plane at all necessarily or like i said you have a complex uh, set of arms coming out or whatever and so usually the the way i explain this the best is that think of the way a 3D printer works. Let me erase all this. Think of the way a 3D printer works. A 3D printer, if you've ever used one, creates a three-dimensional figure, a volume essentially, by building it off of a base, okay, and going straight up with it. And if you have a figure that you're trying to make on a 3D printer that let's say has, you know, an arm, you know, here and an arm here, whatever, it still has to build it off of the base because if you ever notice, it makes these like strings coming down here to give this support because otherwise the printer ink is so hot, it just melts and falls down. So it always has to build it off of a plane. Well, if you're trying to create a volume off of a plane, then double integrals is probably your best way to go and that you could come up with this area that you're sitting over and do it that way. But if you don't have something like that, like if you have a figure that's not built off of a plane in the XY axis and going up from there, then these little boxes might be the better way to kind of fill in your volume. I always think of it as kind of like Legos, right? In Legos, you don't necessarily have to always build off of, you know, a plane and have everything go straight up. You can start building outward, um, and upward and, and not have anything in underneath it. Uh, not the best explanation probably, but that's where this triple integral concept is really different from the double integral concept. All right. So anyway, back to this. So this, this is an estimate for the volume that we're trying to find. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as the number of uh, subdivisions or the number of boxes goes to infinity. And if I do that, what ends up happening here is this is just an extension of what we've seen in single and double integrals is it turns into this triple integral. 
So again, for a triple integral, what you're basically doing is you're integrating your function over a volume instead of integrating your function over an area. That volume is defined by this box, and that's, again, not necessarily always going to be a strict box like you see here in this picture. We're going to have a fairly loose interpretation of a box in a few minutes. Um, but if you're trying to integrate this function over this box, uh, this region, that encloses a volume, then we do that with a triple integral. And so we just have three variables. We're going to integrate with respect to each one of those variables. Each variable is going to have its own interval, which is going to create your box. And the way we're going to do it um, in practice is very much like we did double integrals, one variable at a time. We're just going to have three integrals instead of two integrals. You take care of one integral at a time, treat all the other variables as if they're constants as you're integrating, and go from there. And then we'll go from there. So Fabini's theorem uh, for triple integrals is much like Fabini's theorem for double integrals. It says, all right, well, if we're going to integrate here with respect to z, then y, then x. This is the z interval. This is the y interval. This is the x interval. And we'll take care of one variable at a time, treating all the other variables as if they're constants. So if we were to do this integral where we wanted to evaluate this function, over this box, x is between two constants, y is between two constants, z is between two constants, and if I and I labeled that out on the x, y, z axis, here's 0 to 1. On the x axis, here would be 2 to negative 1. We go back a little bit here, and z would be between 0 and 3. So I would get, you know, your traditional box that I could grid off it would be this rectangular box that I'm integrating over. Okay? So everything's constant. And we've seen with double integrals when everything's constant in your intervals it's much easier to do. And the same thing goes for triple integrals. So here if I'm going to do this, the order doesn't really matter. Okay? Since all my variables are between constants, the order doesn't really matter. Usually you decide which one you want to do first, second, or third based off of the function you're integrating in this case x, y, z squared. Uh, it doesn't really matter here. So let's just do it this way. We'll do z first, then x, then y. For no reason other than I just felt like it. So z is from 0 to 3, so that'll be the inner interval. x is from 0 to 1, and y is from negative 1 to 2. All right, so in order to do this, we'll do the first set of integration first. So that'll be uh, z. So z would give me z cubed over 3, between 0 and 3. Still have to do dx and dy. So if negative 1 to 2, 0 to 1. Uh, plug in 3 for z. That's going to give me 27 over 3, so 9xy. Plug in 0, you get 0. So now there we are. So now we're integrated with respect to x. Y is a constant. So we're going to have 9x squared over 2y between 0 and 1. So I'll plug 1 in for x. I'll plug 0 in. And what I get is uh, 9 halves y. Now I integrate with respect to y. So then I'm going to get uh, 9y squared over 4 between negative 1 and 2. So if I plug in 2, I'm going to get 9 times 4 over 4. Minus if I plug in negative 1, I'm going to get 9 over 4. So this is 36 minus 9, which is 27 over 4. And there's my answer. Not really that difficult. You're just adding an extra step from when we were in double integrals to triple integrals. So, like I said, you know, from a calculation standpoint, it's not that much different than what we've already talked about. From a con from a um, conceptual standpoint, you're integrating some function over this box, and that is the big difference. So we're integrating a function over a volume instead of an uh, area.
What we're going to start doing is this box is going to be loosely labeled as a box. You know, right now everything is straight lines here and here and here because we have intervals in the X, Y, and Z. But what if these values that X is between or Y is between start to become functions? Well, what you're going to start to see is that this side of the box is going to be um, curved, okay? So it's not really going to be, so maybe this will be curved outward like this because there's a surface that's going this way on this side of the box. And maybe the same thing's happening at the top. I have, you know, some other random surface up here at the top of the box. But all of these sides of the box, while even though they're, they're surfaces and they're not flat planes, okay, so they're curved, they will enclose this volume inside. But still, I'm integrating over box, but what I have to do is say, what is Z between? Uh, you know, what's Z between, what's X between, what's Y between, and they might be between surfaces instead of, um, or functions instead of constants. Well, since we've done this through double integrals, this shouldn't be that big of a deal. The hardest part is going to be visualizing what you're looking at in three dimensions and to see what X, Y, and Z are between. Okay, so when we look at this uh, in a more general fashion, uh, we're looking at the limits of integration to be functions. Now, when we talked about it with double integrals, we talked about horizontally simple, vertically simple. Well, in the way, this is kind of the same thing. Um, we're going to think about it simple in the Z axis, in that Z is between two functions. Okay, that's largely what we're going to look at. I think this is always the simplest way to go with these triple integrals is to look at Z first. Because when you look at surfaces, you're used to surfaces as Z equals or F of X, Y equals surfaces. Okay? Uh, you're not necessarily used to surfaces that are maybe Y equals surfaces and they're functions of, say, X and Z. Or X equals surfaces that are functions of Y and Z. You're not used to this as much as you are this when we were dealing with surfaces. So it's just essentially looking at surfaces that are running this way uh, in the XYZ space as opposed to maybe surfaces that are running this way in the XYZ space, okay? So we typically like to think of maybe doing, of trying to do Z first and think of this as simple in the Z direction. Uh, so we would say, okay, Z is between these two surfaces, all right? And it's functions of X and Y, the most variables possible. So we're going to have to integrate with respect to that one first. And then we're going to look at, all right, now we have Y and X. Well, once we get down to Y and X, we're in the XY plane, we're basically back down to an area. So we, we flatten down the Z axis and we look at what's just happening in the XY plane. So if we're here, we're looking at what's happening in this XY plane, and you can say, okay, I have a curve here, I have a curve here, or vice versa, and I can look at what's happening in the Y direction and the X direction. And it's, again, once it's flattened down to an area, we're basically doing all the same things we were doing in double integrals. So let's say Y is between two functions of X. Um, so we have that that direction is simpler uh, in the y direction. So if y is between two functions of x, that would be my next variable I integrate with respect to, and that would leave x to be between two constants. And so you always want your last variable to be between constants so that in the end, the integral itself is going to be equal to some constant. Uh, if we do it this way, then z would have to come first because it's between the most variables. y would have to come second because it's between the next most variable functions, and x would be last because it's between constants, and that would match up this way, z, y, x. Okay? And now our box, like I said, it's still going to enclose a volume, but it's going to be a loosely defined box. I mean, if we have a surface here and, say, the uh, surface here, and then I'm looking at, say, the space in between, like this. Um, since this top and bottom piece is curved, right, uh, the box itself that we're looking at, and this isn't the best picture you could give you, but the box you're looking at isn't your traditional box, but it is enclosing a volume. 
So when I use this term box, I'm using the term box very loosely. Um, we're, we're talking about essentially integrating over a volume. So here's a, an example, okay, where it's already set up for you, so this is really not that big a deal. But notice that the limits of integration are now not constants here. Here, you don't have constants. But it's already set up. This is your Z interval. This is your X interval. This is your Y interval. I could switch the order up if I wanted to, but now that everything's not constant in my limits of integration, I would really have to draw out what this box or this volume looks like and sort of redefine everything in terms of, you know, X, Y's, or Z's. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave it as is. So I'm going to integrate Z first, which is easy to do. So 0 to 9, 0 to y over 3, you're just going to sit there. Z would be z squared over 2. I'm going to integrate that between 0 and the square root of y squared minus 9x squared. I still have dx and dy to go. Uh, so I'll plug that in here. Since it's being squared, the square root will cancel. So I still have this y over 3. So I'll have uh, y squared minus 9x squared all over 2. That over 2 is a constant multiple. I could pull all the way out to the front here to make it simpler for myself, which I will do. All right, so now we got to go x next on this thing. So y is a constant. So I'll have the 1 half all the way out front. I have the 0 to 9. Um, so I'm going to have xy squared minus um, 3x cubed, uh, and that'll go between 0 and y over 3. I still have to go dy, so I'll plug y over 3 in for x. So I got 1 half, I got the 0 to 9 still. So I'm going to have y cubed over 3 minus 3 uh, y cubed over 27 dy. So if you notice that this is just going to be a 9 here, so I could put this all together as one y term instead of having two separate y's before I integrate. It'll make the integration probably a little easier. Uh, so what I'm going to have, I have 3 uh, y cubed over 9. If I do 3 over 3, right? And I have 1 y cubed over 9, so what I have? 8 thirds y cubed dy. Big thirds could come out to the front also with the half. Uh, so I'll just integrate, so I have what, um, one half, I have the eight thirds, which can simplify, uh, the y cubed will be y to the fourth over four, between zero and nine, uh, and when I plug in, I'm, simplify, I'm going to get what, well, this four will cancel the four there along with the two, so I'm going to have one third, uh, nine to the fourth. So what's 9 to the 4th? 81 times 81 uh, divided by 3. Uh, so it's 81 times 3 is what? 243? No, that's not right. It's 9 to the 4th divided by 3, so 9 times 9 times 9 times 9 divided by 3, I'm getting 2,000, 2,187. Right. So, there's the answer. Um, again, this isn't a big deal. It shouldn't be that big deal to do this integration with a triple integral. Uh, when it's all set up for us, even when the limits of integration are functions, um, and it, as long as the integration itself is fairly easy, in this case it is, uh, but still, even if not, as long as it boils down to some real basic integration that we've learned before, it shouldn't be that big a deal since we've already done double integrals. The hardest part is when you have to visualize the whole thing and set it up from scratch, and so we're going to have to see some of those. Okay, so here we want to integrate this function, <clears throat> f of x, y, z equals z. Now, I want to integrate it over this region um, that's lying below the upper hemisphere of a radius 3 uh, sphere. And 
above the triangle on the xy plane that's defined by the lines x equals 1, y equals 0, and x equals y. And so this is now describing a volume. So I want to integrate this function over this volume. Well, let's take a look at the volume for a second. So I'm going to have to do a quick little sketch. So we have a sphere radius 3. So I have this sphere radius 3. Okay? And it's the upper hemisphere, so just that one. So it hits here at 3, hits here at 3, hits here at 3. This is x, y, z. All right? So I have that, and that's going to be the upper piece of the volume. And then the lower piece of the volume is this triangle on the xy plane. So I have x equals 1, which would be this, this line right here. I have y equals 0, which is the x-axis, so here. So here's x equals 1, here's y equals 0. And then I have y equals x, which is this diagonal here. Okay, So that's y equals x. And this in here is definitely sitting inside the sphere. And then the idea is I want the space in between. So if this was to extend upward here, I would then have this, and then this top part would just be domed, essentially, up here, because it's the sphere is this top part. So this is the volume we're talking about. So when I do this, I want to say, okay, well, what is, let's start with Z. What's Z between? Right? Z is this direction. What's Z between? Well, on the top end, Z is on the dome, right? The Z values are this dome piece up here from the hemisphere. So when we think about, well, how would we write that? Well, the sphere radius 3 would be x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9. Because remember, this is always r squared. So then if I said solve that for z, it would be plus or minus the square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared. And this basically defines the top and the bottom. This is the top and this is the bottom of the sphere. So we want the upper hemisphere. So we want the positive square root. So if I look at z and I say, okay, what's z between? Well, on the top end, it's the sphere, 9 minus x squared minus y squared. And on the bottom end, it's the xy plane, which that's a z value of 0. Okay? All right, so now we got to look at x and y. Well, when we look at x and y, what we want to do is flatten this down to the xy plane. So again, what do we have? We have this is y equals x, this right here is x equals 1, and this right here is y equals 0. So pick a variable. It doesn't really matter in this case. Let's go y, okay? What's y between? Well, on the bottom end, 0, and on the top end, it's x, okay? And then once we have this and this, what we want to do is fill this in all the way to here. So what x's are we working with? Well, this would be an x of 0 all the way down to an x of 1 would fill the space in between those two y's. So x is between 0 and 1. So now that we have this, this is our box. And so this tells us that z would have to come first, y would have to come second, and x would have to come third in our integration. The function we're going to integrate over that box is that function z. And so we have everything we need to set this up. So we have our triple integral. Z is our function. We say we're going to do z first, then y second, then x last. So z was between 0 and the square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared. Then y was between 0 and x, and x was between 0 and 1. So now, Start integrating one variable at a time. Z is the first variable we're going to integrate with respect to. So the 0 to 1, 0 to x will sit here. So we'll get z squared over it's an x. z squared over 2 between 0 and the square root of 9 minus x squared minus y squared. We get dy, we get dx. So we plug in the limits of integration. And since we're plugging them into z squared, it's just going to give us um, the one-half times uh, 9 minus x squared minus y squared. 
And this one half, I can pull all that to the front, dy, dx. Now I'm going to integrate respect to y. Now this piece right here, each of those doesn't have a y. So I could group that together as one big constant here in terms of y, or I could do each one separately. I like doing it all at once. So pull the one half out. So I'm going to say 9 minus x squared y minus y cubed over 3 between 0 and x. And I'll plug an x in here and here for y and then 0. Well, 0 in each case is just going to give me 0. So I got 1 half integral from 0 to 1 of 9 minus x squared x minus x cubed over 3 dx. And so now to integrate this last one, what I'll do is I'll distribute this in here. So I get 1 half, 0 to 1. I got 9x minus x cubed minus x cubed over 3 dx, in which case I can group these together before I integrate. So I have 1 half, 0 to 1. I got 9x. I'm going to have, what's this? This is a minus and a minus, so this would minus 4 thirds x cubed dx. So now that I go to integrate this, the 1 half still just sits there. I got 9x squared over 2. I got minus um, 1 third x to the fourth between 0 and 1. So 1 half times 9 halves minus 1 third. And after that computation, I'm done. So I got 1 half times, what would this be? 6 would be the common denominator. So this would be, what, uh, 3 times 9 is 27 minus 2. So what, 25 over 12 would be my final answer. Um, but the tricky part about this was, I think, the setting it up part. You know, once you sort of visualize the volume you're working with, you can figure out what Z is between, what Y is between, and what X is between. Now you're ready to go with the integral. Okay, here's one more. We want to find the volume of the solid in the octant where x, y, and z are all greater than or equal to zero. So it's also saying the first octant. So it could say the first octant or this. It's the same thing. But it's bounded by the planes x plus y plus z equals 1 and x plus y plus 2z equals 1. All right, so I want to find the space in the first octant so when I'm looking at this, here's x, here's y, here's z. So in the first octet means there's basically a wall here, a wall here, and a wall here. Okay? So this is already kind of building my volume out. Now I have two planes that are also going to do this. So one plane is essentially going to come in like this. Right? And the other plane is going to have to probably come in like this, therefore kind of walling off this front region. So these would eventually keep going this way, and I would have a wall here, and I have a wall here, and this plane um, would look like this. And think about if we kind of put two pieces of paper here and here, and then walled off the sides and the back with the, the axes planes. Okay? So it's not an ideal picture, right? If we were in class, I could sort of demonstrate this with a 3D model, but I think you'll get the idea if we have this plane coming in here, this plane coming in this way, and that's the sort of the outer edge, the outer region of facing you, and then the back part behind this is basically walled off by the XZ plane, the YZ plane, and the XY plane. All right. That's a mess, but I think we can look at this. So what we need to know is what Z is between, right? When we look at it this way, say what's Z between on the top and the bottom one? Well, the, the plane here is the top, and this other plane here is basically the bottom, um, unless it goes down into the XY plane. So what we want to do is see, you know, well, what plane's on top? Which one of these planes is the top plane? Which one of these is the bottom plane? Well, the easy way to find that out is to solve for Z. So if I look at this one, I get Z equals... 1 minus x minus y. And the other one I get uh, 2z equals 1 minus x minus y. And then that would then give me z 
equals 1 minus x minus y over 2. So this is one plane, this is the other plane. If I ask, well, what plane's on top and what plane's on bottom uh, in terms of, you know, the z's are between, I think clearly this one is smaller than this one because it's divided by 2. And so when we look at what is z between, on the bottom end it's 1 minus x minus y over 2, and on the top end it's 1 minus x minus y. Okay. Now we got to think about the x's and y's, and or x's, x's and y's. Now it doesn't really matter that y comes first or x comes next. Uh, we'll, we'll, we, could, we could switch this around here, but we're trying to figure out the the x's and y's. Well, what I would basically have to do is I have to have to look at this from above, right, and flatten this down and see what's happening in this x-y plane. Well, what's going to happen here is that this line of intersection transposed down to the xy plane is going to look like this. And so what we have is this wall here and this wall here. So if you look at this in the xy plane, it's essentially going to look like this in the xy plane. Here's x, here's y. So if I looked at it from above, you know, if I looked at it from up here, and I looked at it from above, uh, this is what I'd be seeing happening in the xy plane with that line of intersection there kind of transposed down onto the xy plane. But I need to figure out what that line is, okay? Because I can then, once I figure out what that line is, I can say, okay, well, what's y between? On the bottom end, it's zero. And then I can figure out also what x is between, because here it's zero, but where does this intersect the x-axis? So how do I do that? Well, the way I do that is I figure out what this line of intersection is, and I simply do that by flattening both of those planes down to the xy plane. And I do that by making z zero. And if you do that, what you see is that this is actually x plus y equals one, or simply y equals one minus x. You can write it as well. So if I look at y next, I can say y is between zero and one minus x and x is between 0 and wherever 1 minus x hits the x-axis. Well, if y is 0 on the x-axis, then x is 1. So now I have my intervals set up for my box. But notice there's no question of integrate this function over this volume. The question just says find the volume. So I just define the box. But there's no function that's being integrated over this box. I really just want to integrate the box itself. So the way I'm going to do that is with my triple integral. So I'll set up my triple integral. I know it was z first, y second, x third. I define my box as between 1 minus x minus y over 2 and 1 minus x minus y y is between 0 and 1 minus x, and x is between 0 and 1, but there's no function here that I'm integrating over. Well, that's fine, okay? There's just no function there. I'm just going to integrate the box with respect to z, y, and x, and that's going to give me the volume of x. function over this volume. And this question just said, find the volume. So if you can define the volume as your box, okay, and again, very loose term there, box. Uh, if you can define the box that you're looking at for your volume, then there is no function in the integral that you need to place. It's just simply the limits of integration are going to define the volume that you're trying to find. And so we'll start doing this. So 0 to 1, 0 to 1 minus x. There's nothing here. You could always think of it as a 1 there. So you're basically integrating to z with respect to z. So that'll just be z between 1 minus x minus y over 2 and 1 minus x minus y. So I plug those in and subtract. So what do I get? I get uh, the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to 1 minus x. Um, I plug in 1 minus x minus y and I subtract 1 minus x minus y over 2. Well, if you think about this, 
uh, this and this are the same, so I have one of these minus one half of these. Okay, so ultimately I just have a half of one minus x minus y. So zero to one, zero to one minus x, I get a half of one minus x minus y dy dx. And this half, again, can come out to the front, so I'm going to integrate this. I'm going to do the same thing I did with the last example. All this is a constant in terms of y, so I'm just going to lump all this together, and I'm going to integrate that with respect to y and this piece with respect to y. So I have the integral from 0 to 1, 0 to 1 minus x. I have this 1 half, and then I have 1 minus x, y, minus y squared over 2. And that's going to be evaluated between 0 and 1 minus x. So I'll have the dx to go. So I'm going to plug 1 minus x in here and 1 minus x in here. And what you see happen is I have this 1 half, 0 to 1, okay? And I actually, hmm, mistake here. I no longer have this integral. This was already taken care of. So I have the 1 half, I have 1 minus x times y, but y is 1 minus x. And I have minus y squared, so that's 1 minus x squared over 2. And then this whole thing still has a dx associated with it. But notice this is 1 minus x squared, and this is 1 minus x squared. So similar to what we had before, there's 1 minus x squared times 1, 1 minus x squared times a half. So in the end, what I have is just a half times 1 minus x squared dx. So this half and this half can come together. In order to integrate this, I'll just multiply that out. So I get 1 fourth, the integral is 0 to 1. I have 1 minus 2x plus x squared dx. This is an easy integral to finish off. So I have 1 fourth times, uh, what, x minus x squared plus x cubed over 3 between 0 and 1. So finally, I got 1 fourth, 1 minus 1 plus a third. So 1 minus 1 cancels a third and a fourth gives me a twelfth. I was trying to find a volume. In fact, I got a positive answer. That's a bonus, right? Because you know uh, you're better off than having a negative. Uh, and that would be the volume of that box we were just looking at. One twelfth is the volume. There was no function to integrate here, which is really the reason for this example. And sometimes the questions are worded that way. Uh, so when there's no actual function to integrate over the volume, you're just trying to find the volume itself, we could set it up with a series of uh, intervals, in which case we could do a triple integral. Now, this was different than a double integral where you're also finding volume. But the reason why this was a big difference is it because it wasn't built off the x-axis necessarily. There was a space between the x-axis and this picture. Uh, if I could just draw it real quick here. So I'll do another poor job of this, but I'm going to do it nonetheless. So I have this coming in here, I have this other plane coming in this way, and then it hits this, hits the x-axis here, maybe it doesn't even hit the x-axis there, maybe it completely slices in here, it doesn't really necessarily matter so much um, there, but, so I have this, and the idea is it wasn't really built from the x-axis, you know, there wasn't an area in the x-axis that I was building up off of, because all this space in between here and here was missing, right? Because I had this other plane that kind of stuck in this way, right? And I have this plane that kind of comes in this way. And so by doing this volume in between, which is all this space in between here, uh, I wasn't really building off of an area that's sitting in the xy plane. I was really building off of this volume inside this space. So the triple integral is really the better way to go here. I, I can't really do it with this double integral because of the way I'm constructing the volume. 